Welcome to Stand, where cowardice comes to die. Buckle up for another exciting episode where we explore fresh perspectives on current events. We're going to offer meaningful solutions to the challenges we experience in our careers, our families, and our communities. I'm your host, Kelly Chewbacca. I'm joined by my husband and fantastic co-host, Nikki Chewbacca. And you can follow us on at The Stand Show on YouTube and under Kelly for Alaska on social media. Please subscribe to our show. You don't want to miss a single episode. And if uncensored media matters to you, you can support our show by donating online on our website, standshow.org. Today, we are super excited to have with us Scott Walker, the former governor of Wisconsin. As governor, he took a bold and courageous stand for fiscal responsibility, constitutional and civil rights, traditional values, and education reform. I'm sure you all remember that. He was in the news every day. As a result, he was the first governor in American history to defeat an attempted recall. That's the political way of trying to cancel someone. That recall failed. Governor Walker was reelected to a second term. But today, Governor Walker is the president of Young America's Foundation, which is committed to ensuring that young Americans understand and are inspired by the ideas of individual freedom, a strong national defense, free enterprise, and traditional values. I think that's what we define as a conservative. So if you want to support the great work of Young America's Foundation, please go to yaf.org. That's yaf.org. Governor Walker, thank you so much for being with us today on Stand. We are honored to have you here. Thank you, Kelly. Good to be with you and Nikki and uh, all those tuning in. And I'm glad you singled out up front that it's Scott Walker, because if I'm going to be a former governor, I want to make sure I'm not the former governor of Alaska, uh, but rather the, the former governor of Wisconsin. My politics are definitely different. <laughs> hey, hey, fair. And given our audience, we probably do need to clarify that because they might not know. We have a lot of Alaskans listening. That's a good point. So our audience knows and respects your impressive career as a public servant that goes beyond just being governor of Wisconsin. But what inspired you to pursue a life of public service. You weren't always in this life. No, although as a kid, I always loved, um, I was a bit of a geek in the sense that I thought of our, our founders as superheroes. I loved history. I ate it up. I think as a, a young kid, right after Disney opened, my parents took me down to Disney uh, World in Florida, and uh, the Hall of the Presidents was the place I was most intrigued with. Oh, that should have been a dead giveaway, because I loved history. I, I loved thinking about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. It wasn't until years later, my dad uh, in a small town was a minister and my mom was a part-time bookkeeper. We didn't have any money to travel around the country. So it wasn't until I was an adult that I got to go to Independence Hall in Philadelphia. But it was like, that was like the Justice League for me. Those were my superheroes. And so growing up, I remember as a kid, little kid, eight, seven, eight years old, watching with my dad, Ronald Reagan, speak at the 1976 uh, GOP uh, convention where he conceded, but everyone watching and my father at home as well said that should have been the nominee. And uh, as a young man, I was 12 when Ronald Reagan ran for president in 1980, and I was just transformed by him, um, not just because of his values as a conservative or even as a Republican, but as an optimist as well. This guy was shining city on the hill. Uh, and then a few years later, I had the honor to go to Washington, D.C. as part of a program, the American Legion puts on called Boys Nation. I've done based Boys State, Boys Nation. Was bummed out because we weren't able to meet Ronald Reagan on that trip. He was actually, it's the one week he was in that summer and for something to do with his uh, colon surgery, but was completely mesmerized by history and in particular by Ronald Reagan. He was my president and he restored faith to, in the American dream during my time as a child. Well, that's really cool. We've got a book on Reagan right here behind us in the studio. I think he's transformed a lot of people's lives. Yeah, we sure miss his, his voice, but his wisdom lives on. And, you know, along those lines, uh, Governor Walker, you, uh, your story there in terms of how Reagan influenced you illustrates the power of, even if it's inadvertent or indirect, meaningful mentorship. And uh, what you're doing now with Young America's Foundation is inspiring youth the same way that Reagan President Reagan inspired you. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about a little bit about uh, what are some of the ways that Young America's Foundation is helping to build a better future for our country, and 
what are you seeing and hearing from the youth of this generation right now? Yeah, great point. In fact, Ronald Reagan said it well many times in the past, and that was, he said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. You don't get it passed on to you in the bloodstream. You have to stand up and fight for it and defend it and then pass it on to the next generation to do exactly the same thing. And so he forewarned about this. You know, his farewell address in 1989 talked about restoring our sense of a, a pride in America, but that we hadn't reinstitutionalized it. He made a plea to parents going into the 1990s uh, to, to focus more on American history and shared uh, American uh, shared culture, uh, civic rituals like saying the pledge and standing for the national anthem. We've seen the ill effect of people not following that years and decades later. Uh, the good news is there's hope. I mean, that's what I learned from Ronald Reagan. And even though we oftentimes look particularly at Generation Z and say, oh, you know, all is destroyed. Uh, the fact of the matter is the work that we do at Young America's Foundation, yaf.org, if people are interested, with college, high school, and now middle school kids, is to really train them to be leaders in that fight for freedom. Um, the left tries to intimidate them, just like they tried to intimidate me years ago, sending 100,000 protesters to take over our state capitol. That's why they, as you, Kelly, you mentioned the recall. They did all those things to try and intimidate us. They're doing exactly the same thing to young people on campus, at school, in the classroom, in their dorms, and quite frankly, even on social media. The good news is there's a lot of brave students. The number one thing we hear at conferences from students is not just how cool the speakers are, or the breakout sessions, it's realizing they're not alone. Mm -hmm. And so that's the good news. We've seen it even in a number of uh, polls that we've done recently that show some, some reasons for optimism. Yeah, share with us what you're seeing in those polls. What are the young people of America telling you yeah, you know, despite what you hear from the corporate media out there, uh, the elitist in New York and Washington, uh, there is some good news on the horizon. Number one issue, we did a nationwide poll a few weeks ago of college and high school age uh, students across the country, so not just kids we work with, and we found the economy was top on the list of their concerns. Mm -hmm. Despite what Biden says, despite what others say, they're concerned about the cost of gas and housing and food. They're concerned about all sorts of other things out there, and, and they can see it just like the rest of us can. It also is interesting, there's a fundamental sense of fairness. So when you mm -hmm. ask about things like, should racial quotas be used for hiring for college admissions? Amazingly, uh, students overwhelmingly think that's not fair, including if you break it out by race. Remember, this is a, a sample nationwide, a random sample. And so even when you do the cross tabs, it's not just white students, it's black students, Hispanic students all think that that's fundamentally not fair. Similarly, when we talk about women's sports, overwhelmingly young people believe it's not fair for someone who was born biologically uh, as, a, as a boy to be competing in varsity sports against people who were born biologically as a young woman. And so that gives us hope that we just got to get better at articulating our conservative views, not just from a point of logic, which we should never concede, but tell it from emotional and fairness terms, appeal to the moral superiority that our ideas have over those on the left. And I think we can make inroads with young people. And that's what we're doing not only at conferences. We have the, for example, the largest lecture series in the country when it comes to right of center speakers. And the cool news is, in fact, if people are watching on, on YouTube, they'll know yaf.org is the website, but YAF TV, YAF TV. We now have a billion views of our, oh, our wow. programming of lectures and nearly a million and a half subscribers. So we are making inroads. I think young people are hungry to hear the truth. Yeah, that's definitely the communication mechanism for these next generations, right? These video shorts and anything yep. digital that's on their hands. Um, that's how you reach them. I think that's really fantastic. Going back to those values of YAF, free enterprise, individual freedom, it's good to know that the next generation's coming up. They feel that intrinsically, like you said, it's not in their blood, but somehow it's getting passed down. I think that's really great. Um, I'd like you to tell us about your first attempt to enter public service. It came at a fairly young age because you're dealing with young people now, um, but you weren't immediately successful. I think that's really important for people to know because it seems like we're in this um, everything should just come easy happiness is right at my fingertips. And if I have to struggle for anything, then it must be going bad or wrong. And we don't often hear the stories of people really having to persevere at things. Could you share with us that story? No, you're exactly right. I mean, that's the American story right there, right? It's, it's resilience. And that's right. Sadly, we've seen the last few years with COVID and the shutdowns, 
uh, some of the people hurt the most were kids who not only physically weren't in school, hanging out with their friends, oftentimes having to be at home while their, kid, their parents had to work, uh, but also just didn't learn about uh, the truth about American and world history to see that, that we, we persevered and that uh, brought us back, whether it was simple things like overcoming the Spanish flu a, a century ago uh, or just the, the trials and tribulations, two world wars, a civil war, all the way back to the Revolutionary War. So in our case, it really is about helping uh, these students understand, first and foremost, like I said, when they come to conferences, they're not alone. There's other young people like them. Uh, the whole goal of the left is intimidation. What you, you can, and you know this, having been in the political field, what people do and, and now, particularly in the social media world that we live in, is if they disagree with you, they call you racist, sexist, transphobic, neanderthal. It doesn't matter what the topic is. They just throw those out there. And, and sadly, too many people who profess to be conservatives tend to back down. But what we found is, and one of the cool things why I mentioned those social media numbers are so high, is um, one of our great speakers is Ben Shapiro as an example. He and others now have followed his lead. Uh, they spend more than half of their time taking questions from the audience at these campus lectures. They let anyone who's opposed to them raise their hand and go to the front of the line. What's super about that, one, it's interesting, but, but more specifically, People on campus have heard these leftist ideas that the questioners bring up. Mm. What they haven't heard is a reasonable, rational uh, counter to that. And so being a happy warrior, staying with a smile, uh, not just attacking the questioner, but just saying, OK, I, I understand why you're getting it. You've been spoon fed this uh, by people on the left in your classroom or on social media. But here is the truth. And you deserve to hear the truth. It's amazing. It's like people stranded on a desert island. Uh, they want more. They want to hear the truth, and that's our opportunity. Yeah, that's a really great point. It's, the marketplace of ideas has an amazing ability to change people's minds around. You might be surprised at this. Um, recently, we had Ben Carson come to town in Anchorage, and he was set up to go speak to one of the schools that was similarly located in a, a place like one of the schools he grew up in. And the superintendent of the Anchorage School District canceled his visit. No, no exposure to new ideas in Anchorage. And, and I thought, kind of similar to what your thought, I wonder what they're afraid of. I wonder what ideas could be offered by the top neurosurgeon in America that could be, that could be so threatening. Um, yeah, super fantastic. So I am super excited to have you share with us um, some of the big challenges you faced, the attempted recall that you got into, um, what happened as in your role as governor, and I think we're coming up on a break time. And so we'll cut for a short break and we'll come back with you after that. Sounds good. Yeah. Stay tuned, everyone, for a short break with Stan. Welcome back to Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chivaka. Today, we're excited to have Governor Scott Walker with us. He serves as the president of Young America's Foundation. You can learn more about them at yaf.org and support their important work. So as governor of Wisconsin, you faced huge challenges. They were all over television and it included an attempted recall. You're the first governor in America history to defeat an attempted recall. You didn't stand down and you're still standing today. <laughs> I would love for you to share with us a little bit about how you made it through those difficult times. It must have been extremely challenging, and there was no precedent at that time for making it through a recall. For all you knew, uh, you were going to be bounced out of there. Uh, tell us a little bit about that story and how you made it through. Yeah, you're right. In fact, after the early wave of protests, Time Magazine had a headline that said, Dead Man Walker. Uh, they thought I was toast, I was done, once they got the signatures for the recall ballot. Uh, they thought it was all over. And, and even before that, uh, you know, we had death threats against me, against my family, against Horrible. my kids. There was one that said they were going to gut my wife like a deer. They had another one to my wife that I was going to be the first governor assassinated in Wisconsin. It's just horrible, horrible things. But it was all part of that intimidation process. And, and more than politics or ideological beliefs, it, it, for us, it boiled down to prayer. Uh, we, we relied on our faith, our family, and our friends during those really trying times, first with the protests and then throughout the recall process. And I got to tell you, it was just so powerful. I, 
I remember after the first week or so, wisely, we took a, another page out of Ronald Reagan's playbook and we got out of the Capitol and literally went out around the state. We, we just said, okay, enough of dealing with the protesters. We're going to, and we had protesters out around the state too, but we went out to people. Uh, we went to factories, went to schools, went to hospitals. And I remember the first time I was touring a factory about a week after the protest started, and I'd been praying extra hard and asked friends and members of our congregation to pray with us as well. But I went to this factory and, and I was touring and this gigantic guy all covered and, you know, he was he had uh, grease on from the equipment he was working on all over his clothes. And he came up to me and he put his finger right in my chest. And I thought, oh, man, he's going to let me have it. And he said, I just want you to know every night my wife and I and our kids, we get on our knees and we pray for you. Wow. I said, oh, so powerful. Uh, so from that point on, I remembered particularly something that uh, has stuck with me over the years. You know, in the in the Bible, one of the stories I'm drawn to is the woman who had been unclean for a dozen years, who heard Christ was going to come through a courtyard, and she went and just tried to touch the very end of his cloak, and he turned. He could feel that someone had reached out and 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 reached for him, and, and I said from that point forward, when someone would tell me they were praying for me, I would literally just might touch their hand, might touch their elbow, might touch their shoulder, hmm. but you could feel the power of that. And I just realized if you're doing the right thing and you're asking for God's help and assistance, the rest will work itself out. Wow, that's really powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. yeah I, I, we were we were all just mesmerized. I remember that, hmm. you know, watching from afar and uh, rooting for you. I think it's important to, to highlight, though, uh, Governor Walker, that you – you haven't won every battle you fought, uh, but you also haven't given up. Yes. So, for example, just recently, uh, you, fought, you fought hard for uh, a candidate that you supported uh, for in this election in the Wisconsin Supreme Court earlier this year. But it didn't go the way that you hoped. And uh, there is some belief that the, the person who got elected could play a role in trying to uh, reverse some of the things that you accomplished as governor. How do you keep standing after experiencing a disappointment like that? How do, how do you keep going? Well, it's a combination of things. When I think about when I, I was first uh, a young man in college, I ran for the state assembly, as was referenced before, and, and I lost. I, I, I was wise enough to know that in a district that was overwhelmingly Democrat, I couldn't win. In fact, the woman who beat me is now the congresswoman from the larger area in Milwaukee. Uh, but it, I went out and worked hard. I felt like there should at least be a choice for voters. I went into some pretty tough areas in the city of Milwaukee, uh, and that actually helped me later, not only because a few years later when I was 25, I was elected in a nearby suburb of Milwaukee to the state legislature. But a few years after that, there was a big scandal in Milwaukee County, the largest county, uh, a very Democrat, but, but not radical like Madison, where our state's capital is at, but the traditional Democrat area. And I said, somebody's got to run for this spot and try and clean this up. Well, they'd never elected a Republican before. But I think in some ways that earlier quest that was a failed attempt in terms of a loss actually had opened my eyes to not being afraid to go to neighborhoods to talk to voters who didn't always look or sound like me, but who I knew shared some of the same concerns that I had. And I ended up winning that election and not only won, but was reelected in a, in a county that went two thirds for Barack Obama by about 60% of the vote, well, we won in our reelection. Why? Because we did the things that we said we were going to do. We kept property taxes down, we restored public safety, mm -hmm. we took on the corruption. To me, that's a great lesson going forward that sometimes you lose things, but sometimes losing, if you have a long-term goal, it's not, just, it's not just about you, but it's about pushing a, a, larger, uh, a larger, better plan, really goes a long way. And that same thing's true now with the Supreme Court race. Yeah, I just think that's a great motivator going into 2024 in Wisconsin across the country, um, that we can't just look back and be upset about uh, failures or supposed losses in the past, but rather say, okay, what do we need to do going forward mm -hmm. to make sure we mitigate those things, that we get better and we learn from that and we do a better job of articulating our values in a way that people respond to them. That's, that's powerful. It reminds me of what Kelly and I often talk about how sometimes the victory is simply in the standing yeah hold the line yeah hold the line yeah uh, and along those lines we've we've all heard the old adage you know pick your battles not every mm -hmm. fight right is worth worth fighting 
how do you decide whether to take a stand or to take a seat? Hmm. Well, some great lessons from the past. Uh, not surprising, I go back and I think of something involving Ronald Reagan, but 1964, Barry Goldwater ran in what everybody thought was just a very uphill battle. Not only did he take a stand, uh, but but in the last week, people forget about this. Literally a week out from the November uh, 1964 election, Ronald Reagan, who wasn't even elected official at the time, gave a speech we now call a time for choosing. And, and a lot of politicians, a lot of political figures who are maybe thinking ahead to the future would say, oh, I don't want to be associated with a candidate I know is going to lose. But Ronald Reagan instead embraced that. He not only supported Barry Goldwater in that speech, equally, if not more importantly, he laid out what it meant to be a conservative. He laid out, in fact, we share that with a lot of our students at Young America's Foundation, because if you go back, and I would tell people, go and Google, go either and read or, or watch it. It's, it's on YouTube, you can find it. Listen to or read that speech, A Time for Choosing from October of 1964. You'll hear comments that could just as easily be told today. In particular, one of the stories he mentions is, he tells the story of two businessmen, friends of his, we're talking to a businessman who had come, who'd immigrated from Cuba to the United States. Uh, and they talked about kind of laughing and saying, oh, how lucky they were. And this guy from Cuba said back to them, how lucky you are. He said, are you kidding me? I'm the lucky one. I had somewhere to go. If you don't stand and fight for freedom here in America, there's nowhere else to go to. Wow. That's in 1964. Those are Ronald Reagan's words. You could give that speech today and be just as impactful. Wow, that's a good point. It reminds me that every generation has a battle mm -hmm. that it has to engage in to protect freedom, uh, to protect our civil liberties. Whatever uh, the landscape looks like, we all have that, that responsibility. And a lot of what you're doing with YAF is preparing this next generation to do precisely, to do precisely that. Uh, we're coming up at a break in about two minutes, but I was going to pass it on to Kelly to, to ask the next question. Well, I want to touch on yeah. the, you were talking about the battle. I want to touch on that battle back when you were yeah. governor and mm -hmm. you were talking about the death threats and the threats, of, those horrific threats against your wife. Mm -hmm. You know, the people listening would hear that and go, oh my gosh, I don't have anything to do with anything like that. Right. Um, we've had similar things happen to us. What I've learned in that is I'll pull back on and go, you know what, they're just doing this to intimidate me. They, you know, the 100,000 protesters, which um, the liberals would call something else if that was at the D.C. Capitol, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. But they're just doing that to intimidate you with the goal of discouraging you and getting you to sit down and be silent, to, to not take a stand and to stop doing what you're doing. So I realized, well, I can't give them what they want. <laughs> and so it has just motivated me to continue to press forward. I, I was wondering, how do you, you know, when, when you're sitting there in the dead of night and those threats come in and you're not surrounded by your support group and stuff, how did you think through it? What would you tell all those people listening who are like, well, I don't want that to happen to me. And so right. then they do get intimidated in silence. How did you press through that to say, no, I'm actually going to step forward? Well, in addition, again, it began and ended every day with uh, my knees. And, and, and then I slept like a baby after that because I knew mm. you just gave it all up to God. Mm. But in addition to that, I, I would tell you that, you know, bullies only win if we're intimidated by them. That's right. and, and so not only for leaders, you know, people who run like you and I and others out there. But but I'd say this might sound like a, uh, for a moment an odd correlation, but you know, we think of things years ago like the civil rights movement. Yeah, Martin Luther King obviously was a, a major leader in that, but but you don't have Martin Luther King unless you had Rosa Parks. Right. Rosa Parks didn't give big speeches. Uh, she had the tenacity in her own quiet way to move from the back of the bus to the front of the bus, and that moment inspired literally millions of other people, many of whom would be scared to death to speak or run for office, but to do their own part in that. The same is true today in the fight for freedom. Yeah, some of us are called to lead by standing up and running for office or giving these speeches. But a lot of other people are, are called to, mm. to help defend freedom by supporting those who do that, by praying for them, by helping their campaigns, by supporting young people and sharing their message. There are many ways to be involved in this battle. I think that's really good. I like your Rosa Parks analogy. Yeah, it's really good. All right, coming up on a break. 
Yeah, so thank you, Governor Walker. We're going to be right back with some more wisdom and stories from uh, the former governor of Wisconsin. Uh, standouts, you can support the important work of Scott Walker and Young America's Foundation, again, by go donating online at yaf.org, yaf.org. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Stand by. Africa New Day with mission is actually to create leaders, change a culture, and transform a nation. We believe that this is an area where God wants us to make a difference. You know, He has called us the light of the world. Well, where does the light shine? Where there is darkness. As you pray with us, as you contribute to our efforts, we believe that together we can make a difference. Welcome back to Stand. We're excited to have with us on the show today, Governor Scott Walker, the former governor of Wisconsin, the leader of Young America's Foundation. So Governor, you've got a totally unique perspective on where the country is because you are working with young Americans. And with that focus on the next generation of our leaders through Young America's Foundation, which is at yaf.org, what are the next great conflicts that you see on the horizon, the most important issues that we're gonna need to take a stand on? Well, I think, you know, there's twofold. There's the cultural issues, and politics is down, as Andrew Breitberg said, downstream from, from culture. And so, uh, again, I would say we've got to uh, apply this fairness issue and, and use it to our advantage. The left thinks and talks with their head. We think and talk with our heart. Excuse me, the left thinks and talks with, with their he heart. We think and talk with our head. We need to do both. We need to think with our head, but talk more from our heart. Mm. Share stories, share perspectives both on our, our beliefs when it comes to culture, where I think we've got a winning stand when it comes to fairness, as I mentioned, on things like quotas or things like women's sports. But we also need to apply that to more complicated issues often, like the economy, talking about why uh, free market-driven capitalism is far better uh, than government-driven socialism. You know, a lot of people hear this, they hear socialism, and Marxism, communism, and we had a kid, a visitor actually to the Ronald Reagan Boy at Home in Dixon, Illinois, just a fifth grader that came with a school group. And one of our staff there was talking about Ronald Reagan and talked about how he brought about the fall of communism. We're just so used to talking about that in really positive terms. And this fifth grader said, well, why would he do that? And our staff member was like dumbfounded. He said, well, what do you think communism is? He said, well, our teacher told us it's a way to help people. I'm like, we just have to, to get to the heart of that and do a better job of telling stories. I think on the economy, we can't just talk in numbers, you know, dollar signs, but tell things. I'll give you a quick example. You know, if I'm talking to fifth graders, I might say, well, have you ever gone over to your grandparents and done some chores? Say, grandma gives you $10 after you rake leaves on a weekend. You come home and your parents take seven of the $10 away. Well, a fifth grader would say, well, that's not fair. Another kid might say, well, why would I even work? I said, well, that's what the federal government's been talking about. You know, before Reagan came in, in the past, and we're itching up to that again, you know, they top rate took seven of $10 out of people's pockets for the top earners in America. That takes away the incentive not only to work, but to invest. We start telling stories more than just numbers. And I think we, that really can resonate with young people and counters the push for socialism in this country. Yeah, they start to understand it better. They intuitively understand fairness. Exactly. Get to the heart of fairness. That's why I tell people all the time, you're talking to your kids, your grandkids, other young people. Don't talk at them. Talk with them. Share mm -hmm. things that are important to you. Share if you started a company. Talk about that. Share in ways that they can relate, and they'll be drawn to that. Yeah. You know, following up on that, on that point, we're going to have a lot of young voters in this next presidential election, which is shaping up to perhaps be the most contentious election in modern American history. It's going to be intense. And a lot of young people are going to be voting for the first time uh, for a presidential candidate. What do you believe should be the message of the folks running for president for uh, to, young, to the younger generation based on what you're seeing in the polls, based on your experience uh, with the young people you work at, uh, work with at YAF? Yeah, well, I think there's a, a couple key elements to that. One, I think not only substantively, but but overall, 
we've got to talk with passion and conviction about freedom and opportunity and what that means, because that's really at the core, whether it's economic mm -hmm. freedom, whether it's religious freedom, whether it's political freedom, talking about why that's infectious. When you think about this idea, I, I, it drives me crazy when I look at the Marxist strategies going on in America today, particularly in our college campuses. I've joked about this before, but if we close colleges down again, it would do more to stop the spread of communism than it would stop the spread of COVID out there. Uh, but there's this, we don't take on that false narrative out there. They're trying to pit one group of Americans versus another. Historically, decades ago, it was based on class or income. Today, because that failed, they're circling back on race and sex and gender. Uh, in all those cases, in each of them, it's about pitting one group versus another to, to orchestrate power. I mean, the three people who set up BLM, the organization, are Marxist-trained organizers. They've said it themselves. You can watch it on, on YouTube. It's not you or anybody else saying it. They say it themselves to counter that. We just say, if you really want unity in this country, they're the ones that want to divide us. Conservatives, we believe, I don't care whether you're young or old, I don't care whether you're black or white, I don't care whether you're rich or poor, I don't care whether you were born here and stayed here your life or you immigrated here legally here a couple weeks ago. Everyone in this country should have access to the same freedoms and the same opportunities that our ancestors blessed us with passing on to us as well. We tell it with that kind of passion and clarity, I believe young people will gravitate to that. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense when I when I think of my our, our discussions with our own uh, teenagers. Uh, those are some of the concerns that they bring up is just freedom. I don't feel free to speak my mind or what I believe without experiencing retaliation. And fortunately, they have a strong mom and they take after her. And so they don't they don't mind speaking their their mind, but um, it can often be discouraging. Um, and so uh, I think hearing leaders who are vying for the mm -hmm. highest office in the land say, I'm going to fight for your freedom, to fight for your ability to speak freely, to think freely, and to work freely in this country. Uh, I think that is a powerful message. So, yeah, well, thank you for that. And, 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 right, and, and, and at a minimum, I mean, think about it, at the basic core minimum in our colleges and universities and our schools across America, you should be able to think for yourself. We should be teaching people not what to think, but how to think critically. That, I think that's a fundamental truth that people across the spectrum historically have been behind, uh, but, but those who, who want power have tried to push that out of the way. We can make that, say at a bare minimum, we should have that. I think beyond that, I'd love to hear candidates at all levels, not just the presidential candidates, uh, talking about, hey, you know, if you're a young person, you want to start your own business, uh, you want to start your own career, you want to pursue your own life, go do it. We're the ones that want to let you do it. As long as you don't hurt the health and safety of your neighbor, go do your own thing. Those on the left, those who embrace liberal ideas, those who are telling you all these things they think they're standing up for you on, no, they want to tell you what to do and when to do and how to do it. They're putting all these restrictions on your dreams. We're the ones that say live free. We want you to experience your own life again. As long as you don't hurt the health and safety of your neighbor, do your thing. Yeah, for those people who might be feeling fearful or cynical about saying something or taking a stand, what would you say to them? What are some meaningful ways that they can start taking a stand and getting involved? Yeah, a couple of different things. I, you know, one of the things we teach students, although I think it applies not only in the classroom on campus, but even for adults and retirees and others on social media get some of the same uh, intimidation and alienation issues from friends who push away from them. A uh, couple of tips we give students, uh, which is um, ask questions. Don't just come right out with you're wrong, but but it's really effective to say, oh, excuse me, you know, like, where did you get that from? Because what I've heard is this. More often than not, I, I think you guys have seen this as well, they really don't, it, it's hearsay. They, they, they've made things up or they get spoon-fed things on social media that, that fit their beliefs, but really are not fact-based. And so the extent of asking them to explain things, where did this come from? Because that's really not what I've heard, really is quite effective. Uh, the other part that I think helps that ties together with that is I see, be an optimist. Don't just talk about why they're wrong, talk about why we love America. We're the ones that, that you know are, are talking about the shining city on the hill. We're the ones 
that understand that America is this beacon. It, it's why more than a million people legally immigrate to this country every year. It's why no other country is even remotely close when it comes to foreign-born citizens. We have four times more than the next closest uh, country in the world. Tell people, what do they see that we don't? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, they see the truth. And so to me, the best teacher I'm aware of in the history of the world told parables. So to the extent that we can tell stories and, and make those relatable, particularly the young people, I just think they really, it's a lot easier to tell your story, a lot easier to tell you know, something maybe your grandma told you like mine did about don't spend money you don't have. Or it's a lot easier to tell about your grandfather who started that business and, you know, for years uh, had it in the back of the garage and worked their way up to where they're at today. Telling those sorts of stories, I think, are really powerful. It's why our best speakers at YF are, are those who've come from communist countries like Cuba or Venezuela or North Korea. And now they're here in America singing our praises. I think those are really good practical steps. I took notes on that to share with my kids. One of the things I tell them is embrace the awkward. I said, life is just a series of awkward moments separated by snacks. And the sooner, <laughs> the sooner you can accept that, the easier this whole adventure will be. And on that note, uh, one of our kids is in high school and came home and said, um, they're not saying the pledge at school. And I said, what do you mean? Right. And I said, well, they say it over the intercom, but nobody actually says it. And I said, well, what are you doing mm. about that? Because I emphasize this whole talk is cheap, actions matter. And our kids said, well, I stand up and I put my hand on my chest and I boldly and loudly say the pledge for everybody in class. Nobody else wants to say it, so I say it for all 20 of us. And I'm like, well, that feels awkward. And the kids said, yeah, life's just a series of awkward moments separated by snacks, meaning that... <laughs> they care less about their reputation than they do about standing for their values. I was really excited when about two months later, a kid comes home and says, mom, I did it. I did what? Well, today another kid stood up in class and said the pledge. And I was like, that's amazing, right? That, that influence is amazing. So we're super, super excited that you were with us today, Governor Walker, um, because you don't just say it, you've actually lived it. You walked the walk and you've taken a stand and the whole nation's watched you do it. So thank you for continuing to do that for the youth of America, yaf.org, and you're welcome on our show anytime. Thanks, great to be with you. Good to have you here and have a wonderful rest of your week. You Scott too. Walker. Keep for freedom. Thank you, former governor of Wisconsin and the leader of youth uh, Young America Foundation, yaf.org. You can support them there. And we are Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca on Stand. You can find us at standshow.org. Welcome back to Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. Today we are talking with Governor Scott Walker, former governor of Wisconsin. That was an amazing interview. Yeah, what an incredible guy. Yeah, I mean, he's, he has walked the walk. I mean, somebody who's taken a stand and paid the price and lived for it. Yeah, but super impressed with his life and his career. I thought some of the things he said that were really interesting, like, you know, bullies only win if you're intimidated. Um, I think the hostility and the death threats that he's had, um, what we would think of as like, acts of violence uh, could all be summed up in sort of kind of like a hyper level of bullying. But I think he is absolutely right. It only works if you respond and if you actually stand down. But if you continue to hold your position and stand up and continue to speak out, um, advocate for what you believe, then it doesn't work. It isn't effective. And ultimately, in all these battles he was taking on as governor, he won everything from overcoming that recall uh, to passing really significant legislation through the legislature. Um, he's a super effective governor. His record uh, was, you know, nationally reported on and known. Um, he's known in government as one of the few people who can actually get things done in government but it was because he refused to be intimidated by all the threats and all of the aggression. I think it's really interesting. Yeah, it is. And I, th I really appreciate the fact that he's now investing his life in the next generation of Americans. And I mean, I remember 
when I was interning in D.C. back in college, going to the Young America Foundation event myself, and it was the first time I think I'd seen Dinesh D'Souza speak in mm. public, and to hear his ideas and uh, be able to ask questions, it was a really inspiring moment for me. And I can only imagine what these youth are experiencing, getting to go to conferences and conventions and hear from all these thinkers across um, across ethnicities and backgrounds, but who have shared values and beliefs and convictions that aren't really uh, being promoted or celebrated in our mainstream culture today, and yet are the foundation for how we came to be the country that we are. Mm -hmm. um, to your point about the standing up to bullies, I think all of us at some point in our lives have had to deal with a bully um, or multiple bullies and the lesson that you learn is the more you cower to a bully sure. the more they're going to bully you and even if you stand up to the bully and they end up really hurting you in the process there is something that's done to you on the inside in terms of that an inner strength that you realize hmm. you have that you didn't know before you took that stand I'm thinking of just moments in my own childhood being, you know, bullied for my my race, right. and um, and how important it was to take a stand for my own dignity, right? But also not to come to a point where I was hating the person who was bullying me, and instead trying to build a bridge with them, which is what my parents taught me, and that's the other way to deal with bullies too. Um, I was surprised that. With a number of bullies in my life, I was able to build those bridges. I wish we could find a way to do that now. Well, I think there are some people who are doing that. That goes back, you know, a lot of uh, leaders will reference Lincoln, and he did that intentionally in his cabinet, that right. team of rivals that he brought together. And so there is still some of that that's happening. Um, but that has to be a two-way street. I thought that the Governor Walker's prescription for how to stand, I thought was really interesting. The ask questions yes. and be optimistic. Those are two things I think are a little bit more rare in our modern culture. There's sort of a presumption of knowledge, like I already know everything, so I don't need to inquire or ask, or the other person already knows everything, so I don't have a right to ask. And asking questions I think is important, as well as not assuming the worst or um, thinking it's all hopeless or despairing, but that you still mm -hmm. can make a difference or do something. It reminds me of that story from my dad getting called into a parent-teacher conference when I was in elementary school. My parents were summoned. This did happen here in Anchorage. I, apparently I wasn't the best student in class. And the reason that the teacher wanted to talk to my parents was because I was challenging authority a lot. I was just asking a lot of questions. And she didn't appreciate it. And I guess that really made my dad mad. And so you know my dad. And he pounded the table really hard and said in his super gruff Alaska dad voice, good, then she's doing what I told her to do. She's supposed to challenge authority. And he walked out of the parent-teacher <laughs> conference. <laughs> well, that's and, consistent with the history of our country, right? These are people, right. who, our founders are people who challenged authority. Right. When they got home and I said, I was a little nervous, you know, I thought I was doing good at school. Hey, how did the parent-teacher conference go? I went, great, kid, keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I was always encouraged at home to ask a lot of questions and poke holes in the arguments of the people over me. And also to, if I can't get in through the front door, then I'll get in through the side door, then I'll get in through the back door. Um, you know, as Governor Walker was saying, be optimistic. Well, if you can't get it done this way, then you can get it done another way. You and I've talked about this. It's kind of like the practice of law. Um, there's a million red light attorneys out there. No, 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 no. I don't even understand why those people get paid. That's so easy to say. But it's rare to find a green light attorney, an attorney who will stay optimistic and find a way to work around an obstacle to get something done. Um, that's what I see Governor Walker saying is, how can we find solutions? How can we find a workable path? Um, what are the other facts or data that I need to know? What are the questions I need to ask? 
um, what do I not understand already from the other side or another perspective? I thought those were really good uh, practical solutions for how to take a stand for someone who's not used to it. Um, to your point, ask a bully a question is kind of a form of resistance. And when you start to resist, you'll be surprised how quickly they flee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think not just being willing to ask questions, but also willing to answer questions. Sure. And, he, and he highlighted that with when he was talking about folks like Ben Shapiro and others who are going to college campuses and spending at least half the time just answering questions. Right. right? Not being afraid of that. Exactly. We have to be willing to, I think it's part of what's necessary for a dialogue. You have to be willing to engage. You have to be willing to answer for yourself your convictions, mm -hmm. your views, your beliefs in a way that's respectful and honoring. And if the other side doesn't respond in kind, that's where we take our stand. We continue to stand for what we believe optimistically, like mm -hmm. you said, um, but firmly and not backing down. I think a lot of people become bystanders instead of sure. standouts, so to speak. Um, because of the kind of intimidation um, that we're seeing these days. And it's, it's really unfortunate. Our founders refused to be intimidated by tyrannical monarch. And we have a consistent history in this country of the biggest developments that we've seen, the most positive mm -hmm. changes were by people who were willing, like Governor Walker just said, to, to be positive, paint a positive vision of the future and to go relentlessly for it. Yeah, Whether it's Reagan com communism, yeah. yeah, Martin Luther King Jr. And, and the civil rights movement, Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War. I mean, you could go on and on. Yeah. Something he mentioned sort of indirectly, but I think it's important to draw out, is he would have had a hard time doing what he did had he not had a community of supporters around him. Yes. The people who encouraged him, the people who prayed for him, their friends and community. And I think that's another important way to stand. If you're not the person at the podium or the person on TV or the guy in the governor's mansion, um, just that person who came up and, and told him, I'm praying for you and your wife every day. He said that got them through a really pivotal time. I think that that's a important part for us to take away that um, standing means doing so in community. Um, that it's really hard to stand out there alone, but to do that together, I think, is really important. It's a like you've been saying, it's stand is a community of people, and that's one of the things we're trying to create together online through social media and on the YouTube pages. Um, who? Who do you know out, who else is out there going through stuff that you're not having to go through this alone? Because we're not actually in this alone. There's a lot of people going through the same battles, the same questions, et cetera. But when you are together and running these ideas past each other, it's a lot easier. And he also made the great point that not everybody has to stand in the same way. I thought right. that was important. Some of us are called to be political leaders. Others are called to be the people who support those political leaders right. or who pray for them and whatnot. And so... Uh, very great, like practical advice, positive counsel, and inspiring uh, wisdom from Governor Scott Walker and in his role at Young America's Foundation. Well, a total forerunner. He, so he took on these battles like a decade ago as governor that we're now seeing sweep the nation. Like he passed a landmark voting rights law, just a simple bring your voter ID when you come vote. And that got challenged as unconstitutional. But it actually was upheld by the state Supreme yeah. Court, upheld in federal court. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court denied cert, so ultimately his law was upheld. But now this has become an issue across the United States. Are, are you allowed to bring voter ID or not? And this is something that Scott Walker pioneered as governor. So pioneering standing, pioneering voting rights or election integrity, pioneering overcoming governor recalls. <laughs> I, th I think that it was a great conversation with somebody who's pioneered how to stand. So you can find us at standshow.org. Follow us on YouTube at The Stand Show. And, of course, we're on social media under Kelly for Alaska. This has been another episode of The Stand Show. This is where cowardice comes to die. And you can catch another great episode of The Stand Show next week.
Stand firm and stand strong, everyone. We'll catch you next week.